Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before I begin today, um, because we are preaching, I am preaching from a text, we have just heard a text, that is set in the context of Jewish religious authorities um, in debate with one another and in debate with Jesus. I just want to warn us, invite us to be careful um, and to be aware. Oh, let me just make sure that this is on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, that I want us to be aware um, that um, these texts have sometimes been interpreted um, or been used in the service of anti-Semitism and of hostility to Jewish people over time, particularly by Christians. We are hearing a text that comes from a group of people who were themselves Jewish and who were discerning within and among themselves what it meant or whether or not they should follow this person, Jesus. And the text was shaped um, for dramatic effect for there to be tension and conflict and that tension and conflict, while it serves the teaching, both for that time and in this story, has been ill-used, and is still ill-used, um, for people to be attacked for their faith. And there has been an uptick in anti-Semitism in this country and where I was in London. And I just want to invite us to be careful and gentle with how we hear these texts and what we claim for these texts, which have belonged to many people in many, many communities over time. So, then Jesus said to them, whose head is this and whose title? In this coin, whose face do you see? What face does it bear? Whose face do you bear? In today's gospel, we continue with Jesus teaching in the temple in the week before the Passion. He's been sparring with the religious teachers and leaders who gather there, and they have come to challenge him, and he has just told this series of really unwieldy parables that I confess I was a little relieved not to preach on. We had disobedient sons and murderous tenants, and a wedding feast full of all of the wrong kind of people, and one of whom met last week a very confusing end. Jesus has been asked, what gives you the authority to teach here, and why do you keep saying these things that we do not really want to understand? Today, the stakes are raised. We have not only the disciples, of the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, who don't come themselves, they just send their like grad students. They send their disciples and they bring along this new group of people, the Herodians. These are the people who support Rome. They are people like Herod and his court, who may have been like partly ethnically Jewish, but also were Greek and lived in Greek and Roman ways, they were governing Judea and other nations at Rome's behest, managing its politics and its economy, suppressing rebellion, making sure that everyone got food, dispensing justice. So asking Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor in front of these people, is a provocation and is also a threat. Keep asking questions, they're saying, and the power of Rome can come down on you. As we know, it will. Jesus, of course, he's not new. He recognizes that there are new players here and the trap. And so he asks, does anyone have a denarius? This is the coin you use to pay your taxes. No electronic transfer, then. And one is produced probably by one of the Herodians. This coin has a face on it. Probably Tiberius the Emperor. A graven image. One that challenges 
challenged, if not violated, the commandments of God given at Sinai, we heard in our first reading, Thou shalt not make graven images, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Jesus looks at the coin which is carved the emperor's face, laid out in the hand of one of these people, these people who, some of them are sincerely teaching, seeking to be taught. Some who want to trap him. And he says, Give to the under what belongs to him. Give to God what is God's. What is God's? Well, which God do you mean? Having been in a monotheistic society for a long time, it can be hard for us to recognize how incredibly religious Rome was, and Roman rule was. But we can notice in our own time in the U.S. and around the world how intertwined politics and religion can be. Political rhetoric, religious power. The families who ruled Roman society and the emperor, they actually ran all of the temples where offerings were brought and sacrifices were made to Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and Demeter, the gods of war and household love. They themselves and their children were priests and acolytes. They sponsored feasts and games, were the leaders of the community both religiously and politically, and they called on these gods to justify their wars and bless their relationships and give them good fortune in all their business dealings. There was no separation of church and state, real or imagined. And some of it was good. Rome brought aqueducts and common language and coin and food. It wasn't all bad. And yet he says, give to God what is God's. All of the people there in the Temple Mount in that moment, while living under and with Rome, were also Jewish. They were raised and formed in the faith. They were gathered in the courtyard of the Temple itself. And like anyone who prays morning or evening prayer, or attends a cathedral even song, or comes to the Eucharist. They would have heard and sung and maybe even known by heart the verses from Psalm 24 that say, the earth is the Lord's and everything that is in it. Possibly they had recently recited as we did a few minutes ago, all the gods of the nations are but idols. Tell it out among the nations, the Lord is King. The Lord is King. Everything from the beginning made and intended and held by God. Seen and known by God. When Jesus told them in that moment, give to God what is God's, how did it land with them? How did they feel? Whose did they feel? The people of God to whom Jesus came, the people Jesus asked about the coin, lived under and within the power of Rome, which was a system that asked their attention and time and work and loyalty and <coughs> sacrifice. We know some rebelled, the Maccabees and the Zealots. They were defeated. <coughs> Some few got to withdraw to the desert, the Essenes who wrote the Dead Scrolls. But nearly everyone lived this way, needing to exist under the Emperor, while knowing or trying to know that they and everyone and everything belong to God. We also live inside and under and with totalitizing systems that demand our attention and our loyalty and our time and our money. Systems that tell us 
we can be at the center. And if we participate, <coughs> things will be quick and easy and good and safe and predictable. We might be suspicious about religion and politics, both a mess, but how about late stage capitalism? Amazon.com. <coughs> One liquor in, same day delivery, raspberries in winter, world travel, artificial intelligence. Apple Computing, I like that one. Google Search, algorithmic everything. What about the way we tell ourselves that we can trust in our education, or our financial investments, or the housing market, or voting the right way, or eating right, or working out, or even, my favorite, self-care? All the ways we tell ourselves that what we do, and offer, consume, might give us belonging or comfort or security. Anything but acknowledging that we are gods. That everything and everyone is actually and ultimately gods. Because that is the underlying truth that all these other systems layer on and try to draw our attention away from. We belong to God. God with us in the incarnation. God divine. God the shepherd, we the sheep, known by name. But here's the rub. It's not just us. Darn it. This is the great and terrible truth that stretches and challenges us. God sees and knows and loves us, but not only us. God loves our enemies. Loves those neighbors who drive us crazy, and the bullies at school, and our political opponents, even those on whom we declare war, God loves. You'll know I just got back from some time in the UK, and while I was there, I was listening to this series of podcasts about early modern England, all about the struggles for power that played out in the Protestant Reformation and through the courts of Europe. Political power, religious power, economic shifts, dukes and kings. I prayed in ancient chapels from the 7th century that had been decorated and desecrated, ruined and restored as the beliefs of the people and the rulers shifted. Beliefs about prayer and scripture, about art and music. <coughs> Many of the things here in this room, stained glass, me wearing a stole, the candles on the altar, would have either been completely forbidden or absolutely required at different times in these 200 years. And at the back of Westminster Abbey after Evensong, a friend of mine who works there showed me the tomb of Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, those two half-sisters. They are buried in the same tomb one atop the other. After all the pain and sacrifice their nations went through, fighting for the true faith and to hold on to political power, there they rest, in the dark. Together, Elizabeth is on top. <laughs> but together, and they're passed by this endless stream of tourists during the day, inside the abbey, and just outside the wall, an endless stream of traffic. And that week, last week, protesters and the Houses of Parliament and the Thames, after all their work and all their labor to hold a system, they are beyond all of those worldly conflicts, and they are both with God. Claiming that God is only on our side has brought enormous pain and destruction over the years. We see this in our own nation, as people claim that the Bible tells us they should ban books, or restrict gender-affirming care, or reproductive health. We see this in places that the world is at war. We see it in anti-Semitic attacks, and in Islamophobia, and in rhetoric, and migrants, and asylum seekers, and refugees. Anywhere a community claims that God is for us, that resources are limited and for us, 
and that those others are evil and must be destroyed, that is not of God. God does not take sides in this way. God is on the side of justice and the oppressed. God doesn't have a favorite political party or even a favorite sports team, not even, unfortunately, the Dodgers. God is so much bigger than that, so much greater than that. More than humanity, God made and holds all the created world. May the pets that we cherish and shape the mountains and sunsets and orchards and fields, but also the rivers that flood and the forests that burn. And even one of my theology professors reminded us plague bacteria and COVID-19. All seen and held and known and loved and intended by God, who is in the end beyond our understanding. This is the God who hides Moses, his close messenger in the face of the rock, because his glory is too great for even Moses to see and comprehend. This is the God who comes to us in Jesus, not only with answers, but with questions. Whose face is on this coin? Whose people are you? Who do you follow? What likeness do you bear? We are gods, stamped by God, known and seen and loved, and when we struggle to remember this, we can return here to worship and scripture and the table and this community. But there is more to being God's people than just this intimate, tender level of knowing. We must learn to see everyone and everything as belonging to God, and therefore is worthy of God's attention and protection and provision and care, as worthy of our provision and protection and attention and care. All shows God's face to us, if only we are willing to see it. A created world that is suffering from pollution and climate change, our neighbors who need housing, those in jail and the police, those in government and those failing to govern, those we love and those we fear, all our gods. The earth is the Lord and everything and everyone that is in it recognizes God's all that is God's, all creation, all people, everyone of us. <laughs>